All right, so uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Abdelghani. I'm going to tell you some stuff about uh, my project uh, porting Doom to uh, Doom 3 to Java. Um, and okay. Oh. So um, a brief introduction uh, about uh, s some background about concerning the project. So, uh, so it software is a company created Doom. Uh, I don't work for them. Uh, Unfortunately, but uh, so did some uh, cool games, uh, a lot of cool games actually. Uh, the, the quite known for you know the whole first-person shooter thing and Doom and, and Wolf and uh, Quake and that kind of stuff. So probably you know them from that. Um, another cool thing they did is uh <coughs> sorry is uh, they they open sourced almost everything they uh, they created. Uh, that's that's pretty cool. It's pretty. Uh, I don't know, it's progressive. Uh, I mean, most of these games, okay, so you can ignore the first couple of games, but you know, Wolf, Doom, Quake, um, they're, you know, triple A games, actually. So to open source something like that, back in the 90s, it's so pretty interesting. So uh, everybody has hacked Doom and, and the such and, and modded them and, and to oblivion, and uh, it's amazing. <coughs> A very different era. They come from a very different era, from the 90s. Anybody here has lived through the 90s prior to, you know, Stack Overflow and shit. Uh, people just reinvented the wheel all the time, and interesting stuff came from from that. And uh, you see a lot of that stuff, you know, if if you look at source code like this, or you know, Linux kernel source code, or any source code that's existed for a long time, you see a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, to demonstrate that, I have a nerd rage anecdote that's nothing to do with me. But uh, back in the 90s, uh, after they released the source code of Doom, people, you know, were, were looking through the source code and code reviewing the source code. And, uh, and somebody, you know, he noticed the, wor the way uh, asset loading worked in Doom um, was basically uh, you have a large file, and if you want the picture of the Doom guy, you just iterate through the whole file until you find the Doom picture, and you reload it. You want the sound of the shotgun, you just iterate until you find, and such, and such. You know, when, when I'm telling it right now, everybody thinks that's very inefficient. And that's what the people thought in the 90s. And, uh, you know, the, the, they got angry and mad and went on mailing lists, uh, which was, you know, the Facebook of the 90s, and started ranting about it. And this is not how it's supposed to be. Everybody knows this kind of stuff. You put it in a hash map and such, our hash table. And the Doom guys themselves, they were also on the, on the mailing list and they, you know, replied. No, no, no. We we really worked on this hard. We we thought it out and we tested it and that kind of stuff. And this is this is how this is the most efficient way to do it. Well, nobody really believed them, um, but it turned out they were really right. Um, so this was the easiest way to do it, but it also used the least uh, resources. So back in the nineties, disk space was a problem, uh, memory was a problem, CPU was a problem. So you know. Creating a hash table for uh, something like this for all your assets. I don't know, maybe it was a couple of hundred bytes. I'm not sure how much it would be, but it's, it's memory you don't have. So this was the most efficient solution for, for the game, you know. And if you put it in a hash table, maybe your game would load faster, but it would be marginally faster, and who cares about that, you know. It's better that the, that the game run faster than load faster, you know, so... So that's uh, so, so. I really like that story, you know, because um, <coughs> what the story to me at least demonstrates. I was discussing this with a friend of mine, and he told me, "Yeah, yeah premature uh, optimization is the root of all evil." And sure, but but to me, it really signifies something like how many of us actually do de-optimization to optimize something else. You know, most of us just optimize a place and then forget about it, and then optimizes the next place and such. But how many of us actually de-optimize something? to gain performance somewhere else. So that's interesting. So uh, yeah, Joom 3 is the name of the project, uh, the, the Java version of uh, it's up on GitHub and such. I've been working on it, uh, I think, now for three and a half, four years or something. It's, uh, to me, at least, it's amazing, you know? It's uh, a lot of code. If you look at the table below, so that's kind of the evolution of their engines, uh, game engines over time. So this is the first Doom, 40,000 lines of code. It Tech 4, that is. This one, Doom 3, 600,000 lines of code. So that's amazing. So I've, uh, I've worked on 600 lines of code in a single project. Uh, I hadn't done that before. 
And one of the most amazing things I, I learned is, um, you know, I always thought, you know, programmers, some programmers were super geniuses and they could, you know, fit a million lines of code in their heads and just remember every part of it. But after working on this and after reading some stuff the guys that worked on this talked about, they, they, they had the same problem I have. I couldn't fit all this in my head at the same time. Um, and this, I've been programming for 20 years. This is the first time, you know, in my career that I've really encountered s such a large code base for a single thing, you know. So, uh, so as you see, uh, you'll see in, in the demo at the end, you know, some stuff is just broken and I ha that stuff was working, uh, I don't know, months ago, but now it's broken. And to fix that, it's, it was probably, you know, a very simple fix, but I have to, so some of the sound is not working properly, for example. But I'm doing a lot of graphics bugs right now. So if I have to switch that context, you know, I lose all the graphics. It, it will take me about a week to just switch the context and then to lose all the graphics knowledge I have at the moment and such. It's kind of annoying. So, um, but you know. So, uh, so why this uh, cool intro? So the intro is to give you a bit of a um, context switch action, since uh, we just uh, mentioned that. So this is all very game oriented, you know. It's not game oriented in, in the sense that we're gonna, you know, describe how games are made as such, but a lot of the stuff that's that's gonna be pre presented here, or, or I'm gonna rant about actually, might not really be interesting to what we do in our day-to-day uh, -to -day jobs. Um, you know, so, so I don't know, uh, operator overloading, who cares about operator overloading for a Java enterprise application, for example. But for games, they're pretty cool, they're pretty interesting, they're very important, you know, they reduce errors, reduce bugs and that kind of stuff. So, um, so that's basically this whole intro, also to, uh, you know, just uh, waste some time. So yeah, so disclaimer, I'm not an expert, of course, I didn't work on the original Doom, I'm not a Java architect, that kind of stuff, so take everything I say with a lot of grains of salt. And uh, if anything is interesting, just test it out yourself first before uh, just believing it, uh, like people tend to do at uh, conferences. So uh, the first part of the talk is basically some stuff, you know, so you're porting a lot of C++ to Java and you miss a lot of stuff in Java and you just want it. Maybe it's cool to have it, maybe it's not cool to have it. Some people disagree with most of what I say and uh, a lot of people just think I'm plain stupid. Yeah, so Bjarne Strauss, for people who don't know who he is, he's like the James Gosling of C++. So imagine him saying this about his own language, it's pretty interesting. So, uh, sure. So yeah, so I'm going to start out with overloading, and this picture is... You just have to love, you know, the level of innovation and creativity of humans. Eh? So yeah, so operator overloading, Java doesn't have operator overloading. What is operator overloading? In some languages, um, like C++ obviously, you can define a mathematical... You can define any kind of object, and you can say if I use an operator like plus or equals or whatever with this type of object, with another type of object, so type object A plus B, for example, you should, you know, add the members or multiply them or whatever you want. So, um, like I said, this might not be very interesting for our enterprise applications, but for games, you know, games, especially 3D graphics games, are basically just math. You know, a lot of math, you know, a lot of 3D space geometry math. So, you know, you want to define matrices and vectors and, and curves and whatever, and you want to, you know, do math on them, obviously. And um, so, yeah, so, so the first one, uh, so, oh yeah, so the one on top, so that's from a paper Guy Steele wrote. He was one of the original Java architects. It's a long pa paper, but this was one of the things he said is basically, yeah, we want operator overloading in Java, future Java. But then Guy Steele disappeared and nobody knows where he is, so uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, the first line of code, so this is basically a line of code from, uh, from the C++ version. And the one below, that is how I did it in, in Java, you know, so I chose, you know, to, to prefix anything with this lowercase o, that would mean it's an operator and then a multiply, plus, minus, whatever, and such. And this is basically, yeah, okay, so it's, maybe it's, it's, it's not the best way, I'm not sure, but to me it, it was the best way, it worked. And yeah, I find it, so I created this and I think this is shit, you know. So this is just not readable, it's, it's very error prone, this kind of stuff. So I, I showed this specific one because I had a bug in this, I spent like two weeks chasing it and it was basically one bracket that was too far. And uh, it just happens, you know, it's with, with the one, you know, at on top, the one above, you know, it's, it's much easier to find those kind of bugs. Um, uh, yeah, 
So this is a simple example of what I mean but by these kind of bugs. So, uh, so this is, you know, you want to do this kind of operation in uh, C++, yeah? So this is how I first wrote this kind of stuff in Java, but this is actually wrong, you know? So anybody who's, you know, familiar with these kind of uh, bugs. So because you have operator precedence, you know, if you do it like this, you add A to B and you multiply the result by C, but it's really not correct. So this is how you actually should do it, you know? Yeah. And it, it's not readable anymore, I know, but yeah, so that's, and this is, you know, kind of like what the compiler does, but it's still not readable, it's still whatever. So that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> oh, okay, whatever. So uh, yeah, <laughs> then the next one. Yeah, I had a big picture, but we have no internet here, so so that. So uh, the next one is uh, unsigned primitives. So Java doesn't have. So Java have has a char, you know, character. That's an unsigned primitive. But you know, if you do math with char, then there's something wrong with you. So uh, uh, Java doesn't have other unsigned primitives. It doesn't have the unsigned keyword, which you, which you do have in, uh, in C++ and other, a lot of other languages. Or in some languages, you just have an unsigned type, like u int, for example, which means unsigned int. And it's basically you know, an integer with only positive uh, range. You know? So double the range, but you know, just shift it forward. So instead of 0 to 13, uh, 2 to the 31st minus 1 or something, it's just the full range. Yeah? Java doesn't have that because I don't know why. Actually, I do know why, but it's a long story. Um, so yeah, so the simple solution is just you know to use the, the oh yeah. So first, this one actually, oh, I love this one. This will compile, you know, and this will run actually. It will you know throw throw uh, an exception when you when you get here of course, but uh, but it will compile. Why? Because it's valid Java code, you know. An integer array, any array, you know, takes an integer, not a long, an integer, as its size. So yeah, it can be a negative number. Sure, whatever. Nobody thought to check this or throw an exception when you do this, but okay. Um, <coughs> um, oh yeah, so the, so the simple solution to, uh, for using unsigned integers, and again, this might not seem important, but in games, this is very important, you know. And in other types of stuff, you know, like like uh, when, you, when you work with electronics and such, you know, we just want to wrap around stuff, and you don't want the negative, and you have to bit mask it and such. And it's very annoying. So, uh, yeah, the simple solution is just you know to use the next primitive over. So if you need an integer, you yeah, unsigned, you use a long, you know. But if you need a long, an unsigned long, then you're, yeah, fucked. So uh, yeah, there's no solution for it. So yeah, and of course, when, when I came across this problem, the first thing that came to my mind, which I know some of you are thinking, is hey, use big, big ints or big decimals and such. And yeah, I really uh, thought it was a good idea at the time, and I did a lot of refactoring, just tr trying this out. But then your memory footprint just quadrupled, you know, for no apparent reason, and it got slower and such. So these are some uh, benchmarks, uh, simple benchmarks, you know, just that simple loop over there. And you just note, you know, even a difference between int and integer, which is basically the same thing, but, but an object. You know, there is a difference there, you know. And you think about it, you know, for a game, for stuff that has, I don't know, thousands and sometimes millions of loops, per iterations per second. This is not cool, you know. So uh, if you do this once for a microservice or whatever, who cares? So yeah, so uh, micro benchmark, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, not sure why this picture loaded, but okay. So yeah, immutability. Java doesn't have immutability. It does, that kind of has immutability. But it doesn't have something like, um, in C++ you have uh, const. You have a keyword called const. And just put it in front of something and it becomes immutable. It's like magic, yeah? We don't have that. We have final. It doesn't do anything. You know, it just appears to do something. Yeah, okay, so to, to be fair, f final, you know, it's, it's supposed to do something else. It's not supposed to do this, it's not supposed to replace cons. But, I don't know, if you, if you look on old, older Stack Overflow post, or I don't remember what we used to do before Stack Overflow, but if you lo look in older literature, so to speak, everybody says, no, 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 if we don't have cons in Java, use final. As if this is supposed to, you know, substitute uh, cons. Absolutely not. And ironically enough, const is a reserved keyword in Java. It's never going to be used, I think. 
I hope it's going to be used. But uh, so, so these are some examples. I'm going to go through one or two of them. But you know, um, oh yeah, and const in, in C++, when you put it in front of something, it not only becomes immutable, it becomes an immutable type. You know, so a const in this case, for example, in const idvec3 is not the same as an idvec3. It's, it's kind of like a different type. So you can't pass a normal idvec3 to the function. Granted, you know, so C, C++, when you get that low level, you know, you can do anything and you can, you know, work around anything. So you can work around this stuff. But out of the box, this is how it's supposed to work. And get dimension, for example, you can define a function const. You know, in Java, when you define a function uh, final, it can be overridden, which, which is cool, can be, can be helpful, I guess. Uh, but in this case, you know, this function is not allowed to change anything within um, within the object it's called from. So you know, this is a read-only function. You're just looking at the interface. You know, hey, this function is uh, read-only. So it's also cool. We don't have that in Java, but uh, maybe sometime, maybe we will have that kind of stuff. So yeah, final. I'm not going to rant about that because uh, just that. <coughs> yeah. So uh, another operator that uh, another um, functionality that we don't really have in Java out of the box is size up. And I know this seems like a useless operator, really useless functionality. Um, but you know, for, for this game exa especially, you know, we're doing a lot of OpenGL, and OpenGL has to know the size of everything that you pass it. You know, it can't just you know give it an object and say, okay, this object just use it and such. No, no you have to give it I don't know five bytes and say, hey. This thing is five bytes. So that's how OpenGL works. And uh, you can't change that. Maybe somebody someday will. But uh, currently, no, this, can, uh, this won't change. Because OpenGL is basically talking to the hardware. So this is a hardware interface. And how to, ch to change that is, is not really uh, you know, sane, actually. And why would they? You know? People aren't complaining about this. We're the only ones complaining about it. But you don't have that in Java. Um, anyhow, so a simple solution for me at least was, you know, to just define bytes in every object I create. Um, this is actually something uh, Java already has for most of the stuff that's in Java. So if you call integer.bytes, you will get four bytes back or, or float.bytes and that kind of stuff. So I basically just stole it from them. And I do like a kind of uh, inheritance in that, you know. So this one calls, has this kind of stuff and it calls the idvec and whatever bytes. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So I'm going to rant about this real quick, because last time I ranted about this so long that I ran out of time. But uh, enums in Java are wonderful things that have absolutely nothing to do with enums. And, and this is very weird. So, so, so the thing above, you know, the, the foo. So this is an example enum of everything you could do with an enum within C++. And this is actually the only thing you can do with an enum in C++. I know C++ has an enum class, which is something different, but this is the enum, the basic enum, the primitive enum, so to speak. And this is all the stuff you can do. You can just define values out of order, you know, and you can repeat values. So I think E1 or E is 1 and B is also 1, so who cares? And this, this is the only thing enums can do in C++ and some other languages. And this is the only thing you can't do with enums in Java. And I find it very curious. What you can do, so I tried to write the worst enum I could think of, you can do amazing stuff with enums. You can, you know, extend them. You can, ah, uh, okay, what more can you do? You can create abstract uh, functions, you know. You can create public functions, normal functions. You also can create static functions. I, didn't, I don't have any static functions. You can serialize them, whatever, you know. You can do amazing stuff with enums in Java. But the very simple, basic idea of giving enum a value you know, you can't do that in Java, which is very strange. And because you can't do that in Java, you can't. You get this kind of stuff. You always have to call ordinal if you want to know the order of, or the ordinal actually. So the order of the enum within the, I don't know, the collection, the enum sequence or such, and that kind of stuff. And this is strange. This is. I'm not. I'm not going to rant about this anymore. But uh, it's just weird. Um, another thing is, is how inheritance works uh, in Java. Because Java has, uh, what's it called? A type erasure or something. One of those erasure things. You can't, so another uh, common pattern in, in games, at least, is you have a lot of single inheritance, you know? And, you know, so you have 
<coughs> sorry. So we have, you know, like a like a grandchild uh, object, and it wants to call the super function of its grandfather, but skipping the super function of its father. So we want to call the super dot super function, basically Java terms. And that's not possible in Java, you know, in in that specific way, you know. And that's very annoying. So we have to, you know, work around it. So uh, in C++, you can just call it like uh, the one on the right. In Java, you have to be creative and, you know, overexpose the function in the father or something. So, uh, yeah, it's weird. Um, yeah, so uh, pointers, of course. I usually start with pointers, but I thought, you know, let's uh, do it different this time. And cool picture. It's kind of readable. So yeah, Java doesn't have pointers, of course. Um, at the beginning of Java, people were proud that they didn't have pointers, you know, because all C++ developers, the new C++ developers, they always, you know, fucked pointers up, you know. When they had to create pointers, they just, you know, they either allocated pointer, never freed the pointer, or it was just annoying stuff. And Java doesn't have that, of course, so uh, it's annoying. But Java does a lot of stuff for you in return. But you lose a lot of benefits as well, you know, so... Uh, I have a slide near the end, because you don't have pointers, some debugging becomes very difficult. Um, so yeah, so this is a common pattern in Java and uh, C++, for example. The equivalent of this in other uh, programming languages would be if you want to have multiple return types. You know, so like in Python or Go or, or, or whatever. So Java doesn't have multiple uh, return uh, types, and it doesn't allow pointers. So how do you deal with, you know, one method that, that gives you more than one thing back, you know? So yeah, my simple solution is, is the one you know below, of course. Uh, it's just creating a lot of one element arrays, you know, and just give the array and just get it back uh, within that and such. And you know, it's, it's not very nice, but uh, it's it's better than uh, creating a whole wrapper object and such. So uh, I like this approach. Um, so yeah, another cool thing with pointers is you can do you can basically just cast stuff to other stuff, you know. So here, for example. You have a ma three by three matrix, and you say I want a float point, uh, a float pointer from that uh, matrix. And the C++ you just say, okay, just give me cast this uh, address to a float pointer, and you know it's nine positions, three by three, and just get that back. And Java, you have to be creative and do th this kind of stuff, you know. Why this is important? OpenGL, once again. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip that one. Oh yeah, so this is the only pointer we have in Java which is very annoying, I think. So, you know, it's like, you know, getting none of the benefits and only getting the, you know, the price, you know, you pay. So no null pointer exception. So this is very annoying. And uh, it should be called null, null reference exception, actually, not null pointer exception, but that's also a different story. So yeah, so that's basically uh, all the cool stuff uh, we don't have. Wish list, hands. Um, so yeah, but yeah, C++ is not the best language in the world, of course. They had a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff I came across. So it's just shit, you know. And uh, yeah, so let's, uh, anybody know the answer to this one? Okay, nobody. So uh, C++ and a lot of languages have macros. And at the beginning of, jo uh, of Java, or at the beginning of the 2000s at least, I, I can remember a couple of guys or a couple of people wanting to introduce macros in Java. And I'm really grateful they never uh, succeeded. Because macros are very strange. Uh, they're, they're somewhere in between everything, you know? So macros, so wha what is a macro? What does a macro do? So here you say define square x. So that's the definition of the macro. You say, I'm defining when I call square with anything as x, I am going to return x times x. That's basically what a macro is. It's a search and replace. Huh? This is nothing, this is not code. This gets search and replace before you compile. But it's, it's readable for people, and it's it's easy sometimes. And you can do anything with this. You can define constants, you can define functions, you can define parts of a function. You can do magical shit with this. So this is a simple example of why you shouldn't use point, uh, macros, yeah? So this is on, I, I think I got this from Stack Overflow. Um, so when you see this, square x++, plus plus, what do you think will be the results? If x is 5, for example. And most people get it wrong, I, g I got it wrong. But this is actually what happens, because it's search and replace before you compile, you know? So you get a very strange, for with five you get 30, I think, or such, which is an impossible solution if you pass it, a number, you know, or you would think. So, uh, so, that's, a, so that's an example why not to use pointers. 
This is another example. Uh, this one is from, so yeah, the title of the slide is Death by Macros. This is from an article co called Death by Macros. Uh, this is a piece of code from, um, I don't remember. But uh, basically, when, when somebody would, would do b crazy stuff with, with pointer, uh, with the macros, sorry, uh, they would give them this piece of code and tell them, hey, explain what this, uh, what this does. And the highlighted parts, and I, yes, I missed some of them, but with the highlight parts are all the macros and such, and this is very difficult to understand code. So yeah, so why are pointers? Yeah, so pointers are nothing, so they're not a duck and whatever. Um, so, so yeah, so this for example, so this is four or five pointers, uh, four, four or five macros, sorry. And this unrolls to something like this, which isn't very interesting, but I want to show this one because this is the same one. These are the, exa the exact same macros, but y as you can see, you know, float, uh, the destination type above is, is a float pointer and the destination type below, you know, is a byte pointer, you know. And macros don't care, you know, they just are type agnostic, you know. So to translate this kind of stuff to Java takes a lot of work, you know, you have to do it for everything and, and such and annoying shit. And, uh, yeah, so C++ joke. So C++, you know, same way uh, we, uh, we worship camel case in, uh, in Java, the C++ people, they worship and believe in something called Hungarian notation. And the Hungarian notation, uh, the idea behind it is to be a descriptive notation. Um, I find it not descriptive at all. But th this is a simple example, you know, so this, the one in orange, that is, that's, that's a Hungarian notation, and, you know, the M underscore, and they really do this, you know, so that signifies that it's, it's a member of a class, you know. And then the P, it's a pointer, you know, and then the S is Z, you know, that's, it's a zero terminated, it's null terminated, it's, you know, it's a string null terminated string. And then you get the name, you know. And people go overboard with this kind of stuff, so this is an example of the one on the right below there. But that's an example of a very fucked up one, but, you know, people do this. And, uh, you know, we don't have that in much in, in we don't have it at all in Java, I think. Um, maybe in the early days. And I'm grateful for that. Uh, I could never get used to uh, Hungarian notation myself. Maybe uh, peop other people that could, but uh, okay. So yeah. Um, oh yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, Hungarian notation is evil, but like I said, camel case is also kind of evil. You know, especially in uh, Spring, for example, those guys are notorious. But this one, this is an actual class name in Java. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it was removed or not. And yeah, this guy wrote a cool post about it, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. So, uh, but yeah, so I'm getting uh, so camel case can also go overboard. Yeah, should I explain unions? Yeah. So union is something uh, very strange in, uh, in C++, and uh, I thought I understood them, but recently I spoke to some C++ developers and, and then I knew I didn't understand them. So, uh, so union, I thought at least, uh, they were like a class, you know, so you can define multiple members of a union, so basically class with multiple members, but all the members overlap in memory, and you basically just use the largest amount, uh, the, the largest uh, member. So in this case, you know, the int is the largest member, 32 uh, bits. So this union is 32 bits, and if you call D, C, B, or A, which from the struct, you know, they will overlap with the end, you know. A simple example to do it with an IP address. So that was what most people say unions are useful for, but actually, you know, and this, this I got from a C developer that's been doing it since the 70s, and he said, now unions were actually used for polymorphism, you know, and inheritance and stuff, because in C, the older language, you didn't have, have any of this stuff. And uh, so you had to be creative and you did it this way. So, so that's that. Um, so why do I hate unions? That's a good question. This is a cool picture I made. And uh, some of you might recognize it, but okay. So union within union. So this was a union in the game. Um, a very extensive union, as you can see. And, you know, it has, you know, when you see the asterisk as a pointer, an asterisk, asterisk pointed to a pointer and such, or two-dimensional pointer, yeah, if you will. If you and and the worst part, can I do this? Uh, yeah, was this one? So this basically within the union you have a type of your own union, you know, and this really this really this fucked me up. This I think took like uh, two three weeks to uh, to s no two three months I think to get this right, you know, 
So every time we would write it and then I would run it and it would break somewhere and I would debug, 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 okay, let's rewrite it and such. This was hell uh, to do. And this is one of those parts, it's working, I'm not ever gonna touch it again, never, ever. Um, and also, you know, so while I was rewriting this in Java, you know, and I so I usually I run, you know, IntelliJ and I run Visual Studio next to it, you know, and debug both and such. And I'm not sure why this is so, you know, so a lot of this stuff, it doesn't actually get used even in the game. So I'm not sure why they, it's, it's in there. Maybe just, you know, to, to make fun of people who uh, look at the code. I'm not sure, but it's, uh, so this is why I hate units. This is why you should hate units. So, uh, so yeah. So uh, this is something in between, I think. Uh, it's not really that I miss it, but it could be helpful, you know. And uh, <laughs> the last time I did the presentation, uh, somebody really hated this part. Uh, the destructor, uh, obviously. So uh, Java doesn't have destructors. And the destructor in uh, in any sane language is the opposite of constructor, you know. So in the older languages, you had to manage the resource yourself. So if you, you know, when you initialize an object, you say, you know, knew this, knew that, and whatever. But, you know, at some point, somebody had to has to clean all that stuff up. And the older languages, you did it yourself. And Java, Java does all this stuff for you, which is cool, you know. Until, you know, you, uh, you notice that people, you know, so, so this is from the Doom engine, of course, do, this is one single destructor, you know, they do all this stuff, you know, you shut down threads, you stop sound and whatever and such. Because this is compile, you know, the compiler does this for you, you know, so you basically, you misuse the compiler for your own benefit. Instead of calling a method, uh, close, or shut down or whatever, you do all this kind of stuff in a destructor, you know, and all you only have to destruct uh, the object, which you're already going to do. So it's, it's like, so it's cool, you know, it can be helpful, you know. So uh, yeah, Java doesn't have this. We had finalize, which is deprecated uh, for good reason. Uh, sure, so don't use finalize. But we also have auto closable, which is a cool, cool idea, you know, but you know, you always have to, to do it with a try catch, uh, try with resources and such. So that's kind of annoying. But it's the same idea, you know. So the reason they introduced auto closable in Java was this actually, you know, if you I don't know you, you create a new file uh, input stream or whatever, you don't want to do it you know in the final and whatever and, and always close it and such. It's annoying. Who wants to do all that shit? So yeah, to introduce it and uh, the structures can be helpful, I think. Um, default arguments, yeah, it's a very simple one. So, yeah, you can do this kind of stuff, the line on top, you can do that in C++ and other languages as well. Just say, you know, if I don't give a Y, then the Y is this value. You know, if I don't give an X and a Y, then it's, it's like that. And, yeah, the code block below, that's, that's kind of like the simplest way you could do it in, in, um, in Java. Maybe it can be simpler, I'm not sure, but... Uh, so that's annoying. Um, or it could be helpful. Yeah, this one also gave me a lot of trouble last time I, I uh, spoke about it. Um, so let's begin with the why, actually. So the reason we can do this kind of stuff in Java is because string is immutable. And the idea that string is immutable is cool and it's uncool, you know, because string is the only thing that's immutable in Java. From, from the primitive type, no, not from the primitives, well, all the primitives are immutable, but from, from the objects you have in Java, you know, string is basically the only immutable one. And it's very annoying. And because string is immutable, you can do this simple kind of stuff like what we do here, you know, in, uh, in the part uh, at the bottom. You know, so this is C++ code, and you just say, okay, I want to make this hello world, and just insert it at that location. In Java, you have to do that thing, the ugly thing uh, at the top. And I'm very certain a lot of us, I still do it actually. You can be creative and do it with a string buffer or a string builder or whatever, but you know, under the hood, they also do this, you know, so it's it's not very uh, pretty. So um, I'm not going to rant about that anymore. Yeah, so this one I really miss in, uh, in Java. Uh, inlining is basically, um, so Java does inlining, but it does it for you out of the, um, the JVM does it for you. You can't force it. And inlining is, is basically, you know, when you call a method, you know, that that function call, it wastes CPU cycles and time and whatever. And by saying, I want to inline this method, you basically copy paste that block of code and put it within uh, the, the place it's called from. Um, Java doesn't, ha Java has this, but you can't control it, you know. 
it has a lot of parameters. I don't know. The method has to be a certain size. It has to be called, uh, I don't know, 10,000 times or more. And then the hotspot inlines it for you. Uh, I think Graal has more options for this kind of stuff, but uh, Java out of the box doesn't. And, uh, and for games, it's very important. At least I think it's very important because the Doom guys did it and they created a ge great game. So uh, I assume it's important. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to talk about this anymore either. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, it's a wait list. Anybody know the answer to this one? Very shy people. Okay, so one is true and one is false, and you can test it out. But uh, okay, so this is one I talked about before because because we don't have pointers in Java, you miss on a lot of easy debugging techniques. So in C++, if uh, if you have like I don't know you know, uh, something, an X, for this, uh, an X of an object, for example, and you want to know when this is changed, you know. In C++, you can just watch that memory address because it's a po you can point a pointer to that memory address in layman's terms and just watch it. And the moment it's accessed or changed or whatever, the breakpoint goes off. In Java, we don't have that. Um, we have something similar. It's called... Uh, I don't know, a field modification breakpoint or something. So this screenshot is from IntelliJ. Um, it's very slow. That's, that's, that's really why uh, it's not very helpful. It's very, very slow. So when I use this with the game, um, I never get to the breakpoint. You know, the game becomes so slow, so it goes from, I don't know, 60 frames per second to half a frame per second, and it never gets to the breakpoint. Um, but when I use it with other applications, so, you know, with, with just a piece of code, 100 lines uh, or something, it does get there. So it can be helpful, I guess. Um, and uh, I've only seen this in IntelliJ, and I asked the IntelliJ guys before, so people, uh, why is this so slow and such? And they told me, yeah, it's, it's not really our fault, you know, so this is not an, an feature that IntelliJ uh, built. This, this actually exists in the TI, the tools interface of, uh, of Java. That's where all the debugging stuff and, and uh, instrumentation stuff comes from. Um, and it's just slow, you know, and nobody touches this stuff anymore because I don't know why, actually, but so it's just slow and we can't do anything about it. But yeah, it, it's there. You can use it. It's cool. It's not the same as this. And setting it up is also very difficult uh, or much more difficult than this. So, uh, so yeah. Um, this is another one. Um, yeah. So, so uh, this is the primitive the winding primitive conversion. You can put a float within a double and you can pu put an int within a double or int within a float or along within a double and such. And the compiler would just allow it. To be fair, other programming languages do this as well. But it's, it's very error prone. Um, if you look across these things, uh, some of them are the same when you cast them back, but some aren't, you know. So the float sum, for example, if you, when you cast it to a double, it gives a different result from the double sum which is basically the addition of the two floats. And I've had a lot of bugs around this kind of stuff, and it's very, very, very difficult to find. Um, there's no, there's no really s real solution for this. I'm just, you know, ranting to you fine folk. Yeah. So early in the morning. So, uh, so yeah, this is annoying. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a cool feature in, uh, in Java, actually. Uh, and surprisingly, not a lot of people know about this. So. Just last week, somebody was asking me, wouldn't it be cool if Java had this? And, it, um, and I told him, yeah, it already has this, actually. But, uh, you know, he was using Eclipse, and it was difficult to find in Eclipse. So this is, a, in, in Java, you know, when you set a breakpoint, you get a call stack, which is the yellow part on the left. And you can just basically say, okay, I want to, uh, at this breakpoint, I want to drop the frame and go back to the previous point. And this is very helpful um, sometimes. And can be very helpful, you know. So when you set a breakpoint, but you set it, for example, a couple of lines too late, and you want to say, okay, now I want to go through those lines, so you drop the frame and then just, you know, step in step by step till you do what you want. The biggest problem with this is, um, it's I'm not sure if this is the only problem, but uh, the biggest problem at least is um, that it's uh, it doesn't it only drops the frame actually. You know, if you changed anything outside of the context of that frame, it doesn't really care about that. You know, so if you call a function on an object, for example, and you change one of the members of the object and you drop the frame, that member won't be turned back. You know, so if you did X++, it, it's already incremented, you know. 
but everything you do within the function, within the scope of the function, that will be turned back. So uh, be careful. Um, C++ has a, another one, which is much better. Uh, so this is from GDB, and it's basically, you know, you can reverse step. So uh, as you step into something or step over something, you can step back, you know. And that one really turns everything back. Um, it's, it has some limitations, you know, but it's, it's kind of better than, uh, than the Java. Uh, I'm not sure if it's better, but uh, it's something different. Um, and yeah, who knows, maybe we'll get uh, this in Java someday. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is the floating point operator precedence one uh, I talked about. So the operator precedence one I talked about when when you overload uh, operators. Um, so so you already have uh, operator precedence for everything that already has operators. Not well, everything because string also has operators, but it doesn't have uh, precedence. Um, but uh, and sometimes it matters actually what what you how what the order is uh, you do things in. So this is an example with specific values, of course, not, not, not any value will do this. But mathematically speaking, these two statements should be the same. You know, a multiplication and a division, you know, doesn't really matter what order you do the things in. Kind of, yeah. So these two will return different results. Um, and this one, yeah, this one as well. This is what with multiplication and addition, which is even worse, you know. So mathematically speaking, both these statements are the same. Uh, this is an actual bug I had in the game, and I think BLA2, uh, from the one on the right at least, uh, I think uh, BLA2 is zero, while BLA1 is an actual value, or vice versa, I don't remember actually. And yeah, this is very tricky stuff, and this is, I'm not going to say undebuggable, because I found the bugs, but it's very difficult to debug it, because you're not really doing anything wrong, except being stupid, you know? So, so that's, uh, here's a better example with actual values, yeah? Uh, with actual printouts of the values and such. So, who would actually imagine that these two would uh, would would you know give different results? And yet they would s they still have different results. And th and the reason for this, oh, I didn't explain the reason, but th the reason for this is is because floating points have limited precision. You only have 32 bit precision, and at a certain point when you do something, you have you have to round it up, or the, the JVM does it for you. And this also happens in C++ in most languages. It's just an IEEE thing. Yeah? It's just how the standard works. So if you do an operation, you round it up, and then you do another operation on the rounded up version uh, value, you get these kind of errors. Granted, you know, a point oh 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 one isn't much, but it's still not the diff same value. And this is another one, also with addition. Same fuck up, you know. And again, for our day jobs, not very important, you know, but you know, when you're doing game, you're only working with floats and floating points and sometimes, so this one, <laughs> the one uh, on the right, there's an actual bug I had, you know, I thought I would be creative, you know, and rewrite it mathematically instead of A minus B plus C, you know, I would do it like this, because, you know, when you're doing 600,000 lines of code, you get bored and you try to amuse yourself and you do this kind of stuff and months later you find a bug, you know, where you're, I don't know, uh, instead of going right, you're going left and dying and such so, so stuff, so it's uh, Important stuff. Uh, how much time do I have? So yeah, conditional breakpoints are also pretty cool in Java. Um, all programming languages, um, most programming languages have them. Except in Java, and I didn't know this myself, I only discovered it when I was doing the game. They're very, very, very slow, you know. Um, usually, you know, because you don't go through breakpoints, uh, go over breakpoints a lot, you know, in your application, you just... So conditional breakpoint is when you set a breakpoint and you set the condition within the breakpoint itself, you know. Um, uh, and this, this is the other one. Uh, so this is a normal breakpoint, uh, at least the example is, you know. Um, and in Java, I you know, so this is another microbenchmark. I did a comparison with a simple loop. So the first experiment is instead of i is even, uh, i is odd actually, no? i is even. I put that in a conditional breakpoint, and uh, this is the other example. I did a normal breakpoint and I put a condition in the if statement. And it turns out it's about, if you can believe this, you know, it's about 180 times slower. You know, so that I know this is probably a little bit exaggerated, uh, but you know, I was too lazy to redo the slide. But it's it's much slower, you know. So I notice this a, a lot in the game uh, when I debug stuff. 
I always use an if statement and just compile the code. It's much easier. And uh, it's much faster, you know. And the reason it's it's much faster is is when you can do conditional breakpoint, your uh, your debugger goes into interpretive mode, which is very slow, you know. So beware when you do this kind of stuff. It's very slow. Um, I hope I have enough time for this one. Um, yeah. So let's just skip this one. So so I'm gonna show you the progress of the game. Um, in the meantime, you can ask questions because it takes some time to uh, start up. So, any questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, I'm running the game every time I change something. Unit tests wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, there are some unit tests, but. Uh, they're basically some basic math stuff, and it's not very, very helpful for this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, may maybe they, they could be. I'm not sure. So, uh, so, so, yeah. In in general, people in the games industry don't really do unit tests. This game did have some unit tests for some example. I'm not sure why, uh, but they were only for the math library, and the math library is, I think, maybe two percent of the whole code. So yeah, so that passes, but how you use it doesn't pass. Or how I use it doesn't pass. So yeah. So we don't have sound. I'm not sure why, but uh, uh, oh. so yeah. Um, I show everything in wireframe because uh, I'm missing a lot of textures and blending. So uh, stuff would still be uh, too dark. So yeah, this should, sh should uh, say Doom Three, but like I said, I have problems with blending. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I can't see you. Can you raise your hand, please? Yes. <laughs> um, mostly it's just transforming the code. Um, some refactoring, but uh, most of it, I think 60% th uh, just translating code and 40% refactoring and 100% debugging. So, uh, so yeah. Any other questions? We have like two minutes. This is much better with the sound, yeah. Not yet. Um, I don't expect it to be much of a problem, uh, to be honest. I mean, it's 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 a ten year old game, as you know, so it's not as if I'm doing Doom 2016 or so, for instance. So I'm not really seeing much of problem right now, but I'm also not, you know, doing a lot. Of so I'm going to show right now. The game is not very very playable yet, you know. Um, but the memory footprint is much larger, of course. So right now, the average memory footprint is like uh, 1.5 gigs. And I think when this came out, it was like recommended memory settings 256. So, but it's not optimized yet. I'm, I'm just you know, doing the basic stuff. I'm trying to keep it as is to make it easier to debug it because I compare it a lot to C++ code. And if I'm, if I'm too creative, I'm, I, I lose that. So yeah, I had a... Pr <laughs> So as you can see, the heads are uh, floating uh, somewhere else. This is one of the things I broke, but I'm not going to fix right now because I'm trying to fix something else. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's, uh, I mean, it's a horror game. This is much more scary, yeah? So, uh, yeah. The face should have an angry look right now, but... Uh, because he's not uh, glad that he uh, gets to go to Mars. Any other questions? We have one minute. I'm going to show some. Uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah, I tried that. It was not a good idea. It was really not a good idea. Yeah. Um, the scale of the game, if you're going to do that, it's just too large. Uh, and when you do it, you have to. You're basically rewriting the engine if you're going to do that, because this this is one of the first games I think for for the company at least where they actually were using floats. Back in the 90s, most of people used for for uh, for uh, you know geometry and so you just used ints and you rounded stuff up and that, that was much easier. So this one is float based on, yeah, doing that is uh, yeah, it's hell. Sorry. So uh, so uh, yeah, it's much better with sound. Uh, even if it is broken, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, you know, it's kind of scary. 
Um, rules. Yeah, I don't really remember uh, where I should go. I think it's like this. Can somebody tell me if I'm out of time? People in the red shirts. In the back. Okay, I'm just going to play. If I can remember uh, what I should do. Yeah, scanner is ready. Yeah, this thing should move up and down. It's not moving right now, but who cares? Right? Yeah. Um. Am I out of time? I'm out of time. So I'm going to kill myself, which I'm very proud that works. Yeah. And he makes it all oh, sound, but you can't hear it. So um, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs>